So Gason Technology CEO Ed Korea joins us this week to discuss IT hiring challenges, cold calling, and the results of the 2021 Reader's Choice Awards. Plus, a special guest interview with Matt Solomon and Kevin Lancaster on strategies for scaling MSP growth. It's Channel Pro Weekly, number 195. Two words, branded socks. Hello and welcome to Channel Pro Weekly, episode 195. My name is Matt Relock, technology editor, online director, and your host of this fine, fine program for people like you and and who are you if you were to uh look in a mirror and self-affirmate you would say that you are a a good msp a var a good it integrator a smart it consultant that people want to listen to and as you'll discover later doggone it people like you and you know what here at channel pro weekly we like you too and we're really really glad that you are here to join us for what will no doubt be an awesome awesome episode of uh, Lots of great stuff. Um, we've got a, we got an awesome interview coming up later on. We got an awesome guest we'll get to in a second. It's it's gonna be it's gonna be great. Make sure everybody sticks around for this one. Uh, joining me this week and most weeks is the man of the hour, the guy who rocks Channel Pro black on black, and I don't know. He just makes everything around here work. He's a he's a hell of a guy. Executive editor Rich Freeman. Gosh darn it, folks! I like you too. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody does. So, Rich, uh, we, you know, we neglected in our last show to um, warn people that we were not going to be recording a show last week. So for folks who are wondering what the heck happened to us, uh, we we did have an event last week and those event weeks are uh, really, really crazy here at Channel Pro. So we just um, it, we, we either have to record them if we do a show that an event, we'd rather have to record it really, really early or really, really late in the week. And if we do, and it's harder to do it late in the weeks, but if we do it really early, there's really not a lot of news and stuff to talk about. So generally speaking, we take those weeks off. So if, if we missed you. I hope you missed us as well. But now we are here and back. Rich, tell people what what they, uh, what they we did last week. Uh, we did our second um, cybersecurity online summit of the year. Uh, um, and man, is there a better topic to dedicate an entire show to than security right now? Um, so yeah, it was awesome. Lots of great content. Um, you know, just a, a, a substantial and engaged audience because everybody's thinking about security. Yeah, it was a smash hit. It really was, and the content was was great. Um, uh, particularly, we had a session with uh, with James James Carroll, I believe his name mm -hmm. was right. Um, I, <laughs> that was. I we like folks. We got to get him on Channel Four Weekly to talk. It was, and just do what he did. It was a, it was just fascinating discussion. He kind of he kind of walked people through how how hackers work, right? Because he's a white hat hacker. So um, he actually kind of like walked through step by step some of the things that that they've done to hack people. And did he share the story of putting one of their guys in a box and shipping it to a company. Yeah, he taught he talked about that a little bit. Uh, it was amazing. But, <laughs> yeah, unbelievable. And you know he had, had this awesome story about like. They just kind of like shadowed somebody into a building and then there was like this big fishbowl of flash drives that they branded with that company's name. And he's like, he's like, not only did those flash drives like end up all over the inside of the company being plugged into everything because there was that like malware and stuff on it to report back. Uh, but he's like, he's like a, a team ended up taking it to Vegas and giving it away as show swag. So like all of these, all the it's like amazing stuff. Like we got to get them on. But uh, yeah, it was a great, it was a great show. Very, very, um, very, very timely content. Uh, cybersecurity is obviously top of mind for everyone. That's something we talk about here on the show a lot. So exciting stuff. Now, who was that man that just uh, appeared on your screen if you're watching on YouTube? That is our guest host today. I'm super, super excited uh, to have him here. He's the founder and CEO of Sagacent Technologies, a 21-year-old managed service provider in Silicon Valley. He's a 43-year IT pro, bringing a unique blend of business management experience, operational know-how, and computer industry knowledge to Silicon Valley. Please welcome Ed Correa. Welcome, Ed. Hey, happy to be here. It is awesome to have you on. I'm really, really, really glad you're here. Um, for those who are who are uh, unfamiliar with you, tell us tell us more about you and what you do at Sagacent. Oh, uh, mostly I lose sleep because I'm so <laughs> worried about clients over over the security issues, and it's you know I'm trying to take those clients by the hand and explain that the old way of doing technology, just waiting for it to break and then calling us, is no longer acceptable. And we try to lead everything with security, and you know it's it's a battle but I feel like uh, it's a worthwhile one. 
We're well, saving one business for, at a time. Yeah, lucky <laughs> for you, Ed, that this episode of Channel Pro Weekly happens to be sponsored by My Pillow. You know, with your new My Pillow, you'll get the greatest night's sleep of your life. At, uh, just, I'm just kidding. It's not actually sponsored by My Pillow. My Pillow. I just just trying to make Ed laugh. Uh, <laughs> so, so I mean, Jason, Jason's been around a long time. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, your company and kind of how it's grown over the years and. How that's, how that's worked out for you? Well, it's funny. Uh, you know, I'd worked for three other uh, national IT companies before I started Segazent. Uh, had enough challenges with the way management would focus on clients or not. And I decided to hang my shingle out there and try and do it myself. I really didn't know how to run a business. And boy, was that a lesson I learned very quickly. Um, first couple of years, I was out there trying to do break fix and wait for the phone to ring. That was a bad strategy. Uh, we adopted uh, managed services uh, largely before people were before it was a common word. And we had moved all our clients to managed services by 2004. And I told all our clients, it's, it's you sign a contract for a specific set of services or you find somebody else. Um, that, I lost a lot of sleep over that move. But uh, it worked. All the clients, except for two, signed, and uh, the rest has been history. And in 2016, we started shifting to security first uh, and uh, making that a, core, a foundation for the business. And today, we're on our way to becoming an MSSP. Today, I, I say we're an MSP plus. But um, yeah, it's been really good. I, I'm very I'm proud of what we built. Uh, but uh, wish I'd done more businesses. <laughs> that seems like a, like a pretty easy sell too. Like, you know, hey, Mr. Customer, do you want to come to me when your stuff's broken and you're down? Or do you want me to like help prevent you from going down? Like, so that people seems like a pretty hear you thing. say that. But when it comes to parting with money, <laughs> something gets in the way. <laughs> Usually that darn wallet, you got to open it yeah. up and you do the little zipper and you pull the yeah. money right out of yeah. there. And even the ones who do sign with you, you have to remind them of what you're doing. I had one a couple of weeks ago just said, hey, I just got a quote from a guy. He's one third your price. And I said, you know, and I looked at the, the quote they gave him. I said, there's a reason it's one third our price. You know, he's not doing all the stuff that you really need to be protected. You know, he ended up going, you got to remind them from time to time the value you're bringing to their business, how you're helping. Yeah. And, so, go, go I'm ahead, sorry, go ahead. I was, well, I was just going to say, so you, you said you, you are, you're kind of on this journey of becoming an MSSP for those, I can't imagine that's hard. not listening, like what that means. But yeah, tell us a little bit about that journey, because I, I, I understand it's a daunting process. Well, uh, you, most companies I, I see that are successful, they'll, they'll bring in a new team and you bring in talent that think differently. Typically, security people think very differently than the guys who are going to do the break fix work. Um, and I decided to try and elevate a few of my individuals to thinking about security. Not all of them could make it, but it's a big investment on the part of the company to train your individuals to understand cybersecurity frameworks, to go get security training. Uh, we now have five individuals in my company who get at least five hours of training a month in just security. And that's in addition to other product training. So it's a big commitment. Um, and we've been very strategic about partnering with certain vendors to help us in our journey to getting there. But uh, no, I don't want to say we're, we're one yet, but we're on, on the road to it. And we've been very open and transparent with our clients about what our goals and aspirations are and all that we hope to do for them. So, uh oh. <laughs> um, now, a, a lot of times when um, when people become an MSSP, part of, you know, I guess the two big things that can entail, one is having security experts on staff, which you just addressed. The other is building your own SOC. So, I mean, are you are you planning to go down that road or? or no, it's, it's kind of like when, you know, people, I still remember a couple of decades ago, people were building data centers for their client site. And that was a big discussion. You go to conferences, everybody said, well, you're going to build your own data center. Um, I saw that work maybe once. I saw a lot of people lose their shirts and worse, um, houses too. Um, in our case, we're, we're, again, strategically partnering with select vendors to leverage their investments. And I think that's a wiser way to go. If you find something that we must build ourselves, we'll do that. But I'd rather leverage somebody else's money than my own. 
So you said you're you're um, uh, a security first. You've been security first since roughly 2015 mm-hmm. or so. So um, does that mean that security you have found is like the best way to initiate a relationship and and then you can kind of land and expand from there? Because sometimes, like you know, I'll talk to people who are like um, voice services, for example. That's the first thing that I sell. People are usually willing to talk to me about that. And then I can kind of build from there. Are, are you security first in the sense that you you kick things off with a security relationship and then expand? Or, or are you really kind of trying to emphasize security as the thing that you sell? Um, you know, both are true, but there's a third aspect. Um, yes, we often lead in our marketing with the security and we get in there and we sell other things. And often our managed services become a foregone conclusion if you know i i it's i think it's almost a mistake to have an msp taking care of your computers and another company doing your security that they don't talk and so we've got different teams and they work together for the best interest of the client but the third thing that you didn't mention rich that i i think about often is i felt so strongly about securing clients correctly that if they won't let us secure them correctly, let's say they, they don't have the appetite for the cost, we introduce them to other IT firms. I, I just got to a point knowing where things were going with the hackers and hearing the horrible stories that if I couldn't secure all my clients at a certain specific standard, uh, I couldn't sleep. And so I feel much better today knowing that all our clients hit that standard and many are above it but I have discussions with them about understanding what your risk is. And I'm very visual, so I often make little graphics to explain, you know, here's your risk chart if you do traditional IT. And if we let us do our minimum, it's going to be here. And if you let us do everything, it's going to be this little tiny wedge of risk. We can never eliminate it, but we can reduce reduce it tremendously. And you still have a hard time sleeping. I'd like to introduce you to our next sponsor, which is Sealy Mattresses. Sealy (laughs) Mattresses have uh, 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 lots of coiled springs individually. I'm I'm kidding. I can't help myself. You know what works really well for the sleep problem? (laughs) Whiskey. So uh, (laughs) one of the best things to come out of this pandemic for me had been I signed up for one of these online whiskey tastings every couple uh, weeks. And they send you little vials of the whiskeys. And I found some stuff that's great. And the, you have an ounce of one of those lovely uh, liquids uh, and you sleep well. It's amazing. <laughs> and with you're, a smile you're, on your face. Right. Your new sleep companion, Jack Daniels. <laughs> that's awesome. Awesome stuff. Rich, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, no. That. Uh, um that was what we uh, what I wanted to cover actually on the the security side of things. Very cool. So Ed, um, so other than uh, grappling with your immense sleep problems, what what else do you like to do uh, when you're not uh, losing sleep or trying to uh, secure customers? What 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 keeps you going every day? Oh God. Um, well, you guys all know I'm a stroke survivor, so I had a pretty devastating stroke about 12 years ago, and one of the things that uh, kind of appeared to me in my mind while I was in intensive care was, gee, you're not really living the life you always told yourself you were going to live. And that involved helping other people. So, um, you know, I joined a local rotary club and I spend a lot of time, since I can't go out and build homes and, and do physical stuff, what I do is I have my company help in the back end support to facilitate what they're doing. I do a lot of mentoring of college kids, helping them hopefully see the things that I wish I'd learned when I was in college before I went out and made those mistakes. Um, it's just giving back. It makes me feel really good. So, and uh, I guess between my wife and I, we like to travel. So uh, with the pandemic, we haven't really left uh, too far away from California, but we're trying to schedule like a long weekend every month and and spend some quality time together, recharge the batteries. But I, I, I'm hoping next year, maybe Italy or Europe or England or something. Oh, very fun. Yeah, that would be fun for sure. Yeah. I, um you know, we can save a couple of these for five questions at the end, but uh, any particular places that you travel to that have stood out mm. as like a favorite, uh, maybe a hotel that had really nice mattresses? I don't oh know. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a, I'm a very big fan of Mexico. My grandfather took me down there when I was eight the first time. And uh, I usually like to make a trip to Mexico about every other year uh, and then go to Hawaii other years. But uh, 
Catherine has been saying, okay, it's time we go to Europe. We need to go to Europe. And uh, we're really looking forward to that. We're a little afraid to go right now, but um, that's, that's going to be the next biggie. Hopefully it's next year. Awesome. Well, I hope uh, I hope it is. I hope you have a great trip. And you know who's also going to have a great trip is anyone who sticks along this ride of, uh, of this particular episode of Champion Weekly because we got a lot, a lot of great stuff coming up. We're going to talk a little bit about CompTIA, and we got a little story with exclusive networks we're going to touch, and we got a big one coming up: the 2021 RCA. That's the Reader's Choice Awards. Uh, I just hit the website uh, last week, and just the magazine should have should have just hit your mailboxes. I think this week, uh, right, Rich? Actually, if I remember yeah, correctly, right, actually. Well, I think I think my copy just showed up uh, a couple days ago. So, uh, so that is something that we're going to talk a little bit about. We're going to talk about cold calling for the faint and not so faint of heart. Um, we got an awesome interview. We we had to record it a little earlier, but we have an awesome interview with Matt Solomon and Kevin Lancaster. Um, uh, one from Channel Halo, the other from uh, Venture Mentor. A great, great discussion about uh, scaling MSP growth and social media and all kinds of awesome stuff. So you're you everybody like strap it. Like we got an awesome ride coming up. Cannot wait. Rich, <laughs> Ed's, Ed's strapped in. He's got the four-point <laughs> harness going. Tell us about CompTIA. What's going on with them, Rich? Well, you know, um, uh, in, in uh, conversations with uh, Channel Pro readers and in, in recent weeks, recent months, really, um, a theme that has popped up um, pretty regularly is that um, it's not so easy to find um, people to hire uh, these days. And in fact, um, one of the things that comes up um, relatively often is that, you know, thank goodness for work from home and, and all the technology uh, around work from home, because I keep talking to people who are are hiring like, you know, a thousand somebody who's based a thousand miles away from their head office, because that's the kind of thing you have to do these days to, to get good talent. Um, and lo and behold, last Friday, um, some research gets published by CompTIA that just sort of confirmed and, and quantified, um, you know, that, that observation. And I'm sure everybody listening right now, you know, has been seeing, thinking, experiencing the same thing. But it is not your imagination, folks. According to CompTIA, and they, they track this very closely and continuously, um, the, uh, the tech unemployment rate is at its lowest level right now in two years. Um, it is at 1.5% um, as of July. Um, in the month of July, um, tech sector companies added 10,700 workers. Um, they also added 318,000 job postings. So I mean, the, the gap, the delta between demand and, uh, and supply, um, I, I think is really kind of illustrated right there. So if you're having trouble um, finding people out there, folks, everybody else is too. Um, there is very, very little uh, unemployment, very little slack in the labor pool uh, for IT right now. Ed, would you So your experience is similar? Are you oh, having yeah, a hard time yeah. finding people? Absolutely. Um, it's it's interesting that we've been used to 80, 85% of applicants don't have the skills that you need and you have to tiptoe through it. But the number of people applying is much lower and there's a greater percentage of people who have no background in IT. I mean, I found where those hospitality workers are applying because mm -hmm. they'll say, I'm running a job for a network administrator or a security engineer. And, and I'm looking at this guy's weighted tables and did a help desk, front desk work and stuff. And I'm going, why are you applying for this rock? So, some of these people, you know, they're, they're anxious to go on to a new type of work. That's all well and good, but you really should have some kind of training, taking a class or something. Um, but I'm definitely seeing that. We've got four open recs that I'm desperate to fill. And uh, if we keep growing at the pace we are, we're going to have to have more. So I, I'm actually, here we are, a small IT company. I'm thinking about hiring my own in-house recruiter to help me with this. This is just a monumental task. Are you, are, so are you finding that, that people are, are expecting that because of the labor shortage that they could just go to a company and, and they'll just train them? Are some companies doing that? Like, okay, you're a body. You, see you're, you say you're moldable. Like, I we'll don't teach you what you need to know. Of the ones who had absolutely no background in the industry, when I've asked that question, they didn't even have a plan. They hadn't thought it that far. <laughs> and I'm going, okay, desire to do it isn't usually enough to get hired. <laughs> but is it in a labor shortage? That's the question. No. Well, <laughs> okay, okay. So something else we're planning to do. We're going to create our own paid internship. We used to do these in the past. 
And it was easier to have relationships with colleges and things. But during the pandemic, those relationships kind of fell apart for obvious reasons. So we're going to create a new paid internship program. We're going to be hiring individuals who may have very little skill. Hopefully they've got, they've got some hands on, even as a gamer and building their own machine. But if we're, we're going to peer into their soul, we're going to see if that's an individual who we want to invest in and grow with the company. But we're really going to be looking at the soft skills, communication, desire to grow a career. And when we see those individuals, that's going to be the next step for building our own. Yeah, I was really, um, really curious about that. I, part of why I wanted to talk about uh, this CompTIA research here is because I remember speaking with you about that internship program you used to do um, a few years back. I mean, they, and I, I mean, I think you through the years have done a number of different things that are um, a little bit more creative in terms of um, finding talent than, uh, you know, the average channel per reader. And if, if there's ever been a time when people sort of need ideas about, well, what do I do? Where do I find people? This, so you're, you're, you're doing the internship program again, and maybe hiring a recruiter, those right there are two great um, uh, suggestions that people probably haven't considered. And anything else kind of floating around that you might do to, to fix well, this account cap? Well, Matt suggested at the beginning. So I was patting myself on the back for finally hiring individuals who were far afield from our offices just before the pandemic. And then the pandemic came and we started in the challenges, maintain the culture and the feeling of camaraderie when everybody's working from home. That's harder. And you have to have people cut from a certain cloth that are going to survive in that environment. What I've found is the further afield, the harder it is to maintain those relationships. And so we've had to change a little bit in how we communicate to continue to foster those, those ties. And so like one of the things we do coming up in a couple hours is our our weekly all hands meeting where we all get together and, you know, and talk about how the week's gone and what people are planning for the weekend. That little addition has helped immensely. So we have to think, you're right, Rich, we have to think and try new things. Have you tried like putting like a little stack of network cards out front of the office and like a, like a big rope to catch people as they I haven't tried that but I'll, if, if it works I'll let you know Matt <laughs> I I want to know yeah let me know because uh every, everybody needs needs help getting new people I, so. I think rather than network cards maybe a slice of cheesecake and 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 then the room you know that would I'd go for that <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to think like what would what would attract a tech person though because like anybody would want a slice of cheesecake maybe like uh you put a a Fortnite mouse pad or something out like what would what would get the techies that would have the qualifications well i would tend to think a few pieces of a component so no no computer case but maybe a motherboard and there's a video card and something else and techies like like i used to be we can't resist to put it together oh there's another one really man get him get him <laughs> and he's dangling upside down yeah i love it i love it that's uh that's a good plan <laughs> So let me know how that works out for you. Um, and if you need me to come bail you out, um, call Rich. <laughs> <laughs> Rich, uh, we, have, we have another story we want to touch on here real quick. And folks, um, you know, there's lots here that we're going to talk about. And, um, you know, we're going to touch on these stories a little bit and kind of give our thoughts. But if you want to go read the meat uh, of these particular things and get all the details, if you're listening, go to channelpornetwork.com and find the show sheet for episode 195. We've got all the, the um, links in there listed out for you. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, open up the description area. Hit the like button too while you're while you're putzing around the description area in YouTube. We really appreciate that. Hey, leave us a comment too. We, we like those as well. Uh, but uh, we open that description area. We got all the links in there uh, to these stories that you can go and check out as well. So, Rich, um, exclusive networks. Uh, they've got some news. We're gonna kind of just touch on it quickly and then send people off to learn more. What what are they doing? Um, so exclusive networks, and they, they're a, a value added distributor. They're, they're sort of a distribution specialist. They focus on um, cybersecurity and networking. And so um, what they are doing essentially is what the broadline distributors, the Ingram Micros and Tech Datas and Synexes of the world um, have been doing in some cases for a number of years right now. They, they are kind of you know, getting into the, the on-demand, the as a service. Um, uh, but what's a little bit different about exclusive networks is that they're doing that around um, security and networking gear. Um, so uh, the, the big distribution guys, they all now have these um, 
uh, kind of hardware as a service, tech as a service sorts of uh, sorts of offerings where you can take typically um, cloud software and then maybe a PC and bundle it all together, sell it to your customer at a, a monthly subscription um, rate uh, as an operating expense instead of a capital expense. This we know is how businesses increasingly prefer to buy. Um, and so the distributors are, are uh, making it easier for customers to buy the, the way they want to and for partners to sell the way their customers want to buy. Um, exclusive Networks um, is, is now getting into that too. In fact, they, they have had this um, XOD, Exclusive Networks On Demand um, platform in Europe um, where they are headquartered for a while. They have just now brought XOD into the US here. And um, so the, the key differentiator here, the key difference to, to focus on is just that they are doing some things, they're selling some things on that as a service basis that you don't find as much um, via other distributors. And so it's just another way, another tool that channel pros can use to kind of shift their business model more in that as a service direction and keep up with the, uh, you know, what their customers are looking for. Yeah, interesting. you said this was something that people should definitely go and check out. Yeah, you know, when I think about the future and where we're going, we're going to have to adopt things like that, where much more of this stuff is in the cloud. People don't have to invest in the stuff and put it on their office. Um, and yeah, we, I, I think we all should be looking in and listening to what's happening here. Yeah, for sure. So we'll put a link to the story uh, in the uh, show notes there that we talked about earlier. So go and check that out and learn a little bit more about that. But Rich, what we I know what we want to move on to, what everybody is kind of interested in is results. And the results are in the 2021 Channel Pro Reader's Choice Awards has occurred and that has been published. Rich, uh, for those who may not be familiar with the Reader's Choice Awards, tell them what that is and what it's all about. Well, this, this, I mean, for us, this is one of the big landmarks on the calendar, one of the big, um, biggest things we do all year, and we, we look forward to it, quite honestly, all year long. So we have a few uh, sort of um, uh, award programs and sort of specialty articles where we'll um, call out this or, or, or that, but um, the uh, most of that it reflects the the judgment of the channel pro team so like met matt and i and our colleague colleen fry like this week we're in the process of of selecting the channel pro all-stars for this year which is where we call out really uh, notable accomplishments in the in the vendor community but that's us talking to you about what we think is interesting reader's choice is where you get to tell us what matters to you we, we give you 50 categories uh, in the tech industry, hardware categories, software, managed services, cloud security, et cetera. We, we give you um, hundreds of you, um, you know, uh, speaking on behalf of your peers, a ballot and let you vote for your favorites in, in all these different categories. And then uh, we anxiously await the results and see what you selected in, in, uh, uh, in our August issue pretty much every year. And it's a, it's a big list of categories. Um, I think what we should do, Rich, is kind of how we normally approach this here on the show. We'll, uh, we'll pick out maybe a couple of the categories that may have seemed interesting or stood out to, to you and to me. And Ed, if you got a chance to peruse the winners, if any of you want to talk about a couple of those categories, if something stood out to you, um, we can each talk about one or two, and then we'll, uh, we'll move on and let everyone go and check out the list for themselves um, uh, and uh, learn, learn a little bit more. So Rich, why don't we start with you? Why don't you pick one category to kind of talk about? Uh, well, is it is it cheating if I quickly run through three? Because the the <laughs> the results aren't um, uh, aren't themselves the significance here, but I just do want to call attention to the fact that um, uh, there are some new categories on the list here, and and all of them that the three that I quickly want to mention are categories that really should have been on the ballot earlier, and we're sort of rectifying a, a lapse by finally getting in there. So, for example, we finally this year handed out. Uh, a documentation uh, award for the first time. And uh, by surprise, IT Blue took on the gold medal first year in, in documentation. Um, we handed out our first EDR slash XDR award this year. And XDR is a new enough category that I don't feel like we're late to the game there, but how, you know, how did it take us this long to have an EDR award? But um, the one really interesting thing, so the, the winners in order were Sophos, Microsoft, and Fortinet in EDR slash XDR. Did you notice who's not there? Sentinel one, which is like the, you know, the Kleenex of EDR. Um, I was going to say, I, re I really was astounded that Sentinel one wasn't there. And they, they 
scored very well. I mean, they, I can't remember if they were fourth place. They probably, but you know, they, they were near the top in the results. They did. They were not in the top three. It was very, very interesting. But we know why that is. I mean, Sentinel one didn't want to sell themselves to smaller entities. It took a while for distributors to say, Hey, we'll resell it. So Sentinel one's kind of new in the marketplace for those of us who adopted it. Like me, it's made a big splash. We love it, but yeah, it's kind of new to the marketplace for the typical SMB. I think that's exactly right, actually, and and you know, and that that has very much been a strategy on their part because like they they're partnering very closely with Enable um, now, and that's a similar sort of thing. Instead of going after that MSP market ourselves, we'll maybe do that through somebody else. So yeah, you're you're probably right. There, there are a lot of people out there who just don't have that direct experience with them yet. Yet. Uh, and then um, the, the two other categories um, that we you know should have had before, we finally got them now. That there's a password management slash identity and access management and security awareness training, um, both huge security related. Uh, and and the one interesting thing in those results, I will flag, is that the the gold medal winner in our very first password management identity access management uh, category was um, log me in for last pass. Um, which is just interesting to me because I mean, because the the last pass folks um, have just I mean really within the last I don't know six twelve months something like that I think they've begun going out to the channel again but I mean log me in kind of has a, a not so channel friendly reputation it was interesting to me um, to see them see them take the gold medal in this category it's a it's a great product but last but, pass yeah yeah but, or, or but, log me in or both. But but a difficult relationship to keep, you know. So, you know, yeah. MSPs, we have a, we have a challenge. It's like who are you going to partner with and why? Yeah. <laughs> so, Ed, do you want to pick a, a cat? Oh, see, Rich, I, I said take pick one category. Pick like nine to talk about. <laughs> would you would you would you like to uh, pick one that stood out to you? Um, well, there's there's a bunch. A lot of categories. Um, I, yeah. I'm I'm thrilled to see that certain vendors that I really have made it part of my company to be ranking so well. <clears throat> Dado, um, uh, <laughs> a great company, and uh, for those of you who haven't partnered with them, when you do, uh, they become a part of your company. That, that's that's one relationship I'm really happy I built. Um, yeah, I, security awareness training, I think that's really incredibly important. I'm a little frustrated to see no before came in number one, but they've got the best product. And again, it's a situation where it's the best product hands down, but a difficult relationship because no before wants to go direct. Yeah. It, it, which is interesting because I mean the, the second and third place finishers there were Webroot and ID Agent, both very channel friendly. But um, maybe the theme that's emerging here is at the end of the day, um, channel pros will go with the best product, even if it's not the best partner experience. I think if it's critical, they will. That's true. Yeah, I will put I will pick out a category because this is the first time I think in in Reader's Choice Awards history, Rich, correct me if I'm wrong. We have a three-way tie in one category, which I, I thought that was is kind of interesting. Three-way tie. I think you're right. Yeah. So the best networking category, best networking vendor, we had Cisco in the in the lead for gold. Um, we had uh, who was silver there? Ubiquity was was silver, and then we had a three-way tie for third place, which was Aruba, Dado, and Netgear, which I thought was pretty fascinating. That uh, that <laughs> that we had a three-way tie in in, uh, in that and all all really good companies i i, I really find it interesting because dad was still somewhat new to networking they're not like you know they're not as new as they were a year or so ago but like that they're getting ranked right up there with companies like netgear who have been around and networking forever you know that's very very interesting to me well i mean data is doing something very unique i mean all of their network gear is manageable via the cloud now that's not so unique today um but that's they've made, basically made their networking gear. It's that way or not. So the only reason you'd buy it is if, you know, this was a key tenant of my company when we started. I only wanted to sell things that we could remotely administer. So when Datto started selling network gear that you could get into the power switches, the power supplies, the wire, Wi-Fi units, everything, that's a strategic value to an MSP. So it's to me, it was no surprise that they were number three. 
it is a surprise to me why Netgear has not gotten on that bandwagon and realized it's something they need to do big time because they make great products, but they're not necessarily remotely administrable. Yeah, I think that they're getting a couple lines. I think that are now, but but yeah, it's not it's not like it's like the, their focus for sure. Yeah, uh, Rich, I, even though you already had like sixteen, do uh, you want to take one more or three? I, I, I was going to say I I'm happy to let you pick another and and even it up a little bit. No, that's okay. You you you've kind of tracked this list a lot a lot closer than I think uh, the rest of us have. So you're going to know what's interesting based on voting of previous years. So call out one uh, that also surprised you. Um. Well, I, I don't know that it surprised me, but it was it was uh, um, this is another new category. And it's like um, if there was any one um, argument that had to be settled, this is it. Right. Especially now. So we added a, uh, a video collaboration uh, uh, topic uh, this year. So th this was your chance, Channel Pros, to, to chime in on Teams versus Zoom and and tell us your pick. And uh, maybe it's not a surprise because um, Channel Pros as, as a whole are very Microsoft focused, but uh, Teams won. Teams beat Zoom uh, in the video collaboration category. Settled science now, Rich and Ed, Teams over Zoom. That's... Uh, I'm a typical MSP in that response. Uh, we <laughs> use Teams exclusively internally, but we also have an account with Zoom because I tend to find that I don't know how technically adept my prospect's going to be, and I'd rather send them a Zoom link today than maybe have to get involved with their IT just to have a meeting with them. So we use Teams internally, Zoom externally, and Microsoft, if you're listening, get to work so you make it so easy that I only have to have that one platform. Very good point. Very good point. Ed, you want to pick out one more category to talk about that you thought was uh, was kind of interesting? There's just so much in this report. I mean, um, I don't know. I mean, uh, the, the best network security uh, vendor, uh, SonicWall. SonicWall has been a champion of our channel. Uh, they've really tried to support us. It was interesting when I was looking at best endpoint security. It was Sophos was number one. Um, so things flop around and move around. Um, I, if you haven't seen the report, you just got to go through the report because it's really interesting. You're not going to agree with everything, but it's you need to be keyed into these things because people, well, as soon as they get to the top of the heap, they start sliding down. So we need to know who's up, up and mobile and coming up. Yeah, Rich. Any any of these um, were like you're like I cannot believe they won. Like, was there any uh, anyone like that that was like really surprising? Um, you know, it, it, it was kind of similar. We talked before about the, you know, EDR category. Why, why isn't Sentinel-1 in the top three? That's amazing. Um, we had a, a hyper-converged infrastructure category and no Nutanix. Um, it, and and the, the winners were um, Microsoft, uh, I think, got the gold and um, AWS tied for silver. And, and the presumption is that's Azure Stack on the Microsoft side and Outposts on the AWS side. Um, and I, I guess I am continually reminded that those platforms, which I tend to think of as being bigger, bigger, bulkier, more, you know, I don't know, mid-market enterprise, I, they're very popular with, uh, with our readers. Very much so. You can tell this is definitely like a lot of business users, especially when you get down to things like best laptop, which I, I like to keep an eye on year to year. Lenovo's still in the lead, but Dell and HPs tend to go, I think, back and forth for silver and bronze, depending on the year. And uh, this year, Dell's uh, Dell's in silver and HPs in bronze. We'll see what happens next time. You know, but, uh, Le Lenovo was the runaway winner for many years. And Dell and HP have been just snip snipping at their heels. And uh I like Lenovo a lot, but I've been looking at some of those thin and light Dells and I'm, you know, a little salivating at a wipe it away from my cheek. <laughs> cheek. But uh, they're doing good. I think the difference between a really mainstream good laptop and the top of the line has really diminished. And so there are no, in, in that category, runaway winners. Yeah, that's true. Lenovo's got a lot of a lot of fight. HP had, um, in particular, some really interesting designs that came out this year, um, like the the Folio and the Dragonfly, which were really really cool products. Um, so yeah, yeah where's, where's roll up phones? I didn't see that or foldable phones. Yeah, I think only Samsung has one of those, right? Uh, we do have a best mobile category, don't we? Well, really? I was just watching their uh, 
their rollout the other day of the version three of their foldable phones. And I'm, I'm getting to a point where I'm starting to get intrigued and go, hmm, I might want one of these. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Lenovo has that fold, that that Fold X1, which is yeah. kind of interesting. So it's like a like a notebook that folds. Right, and, I, and Microsoft has their foldable phone too. Right, right. You're which right. I'm yeah. when I go to conferences, people are pulling it out next to me, and I'm looking at them with envy. Yeah, <laughs> the one I was really look kind of excited about was the one that LG showed. Um, I was either at CES or at. Um, the other big smartphone mobile technology convention last year before they exited out of smartphones um, completely. And that was like their LG rollable. So it was like a phone, but then I had this the screen extension that kind of rolled up instead of folding. And I'm like, that's cool. You know, like you can have it normal size or you can fold, like let it expand. Unfortunately that never saw the light of day, but uh, it was really, really cool. Anyway, we're getting off topic. So uh, I think that's probably a good place to stop. There's lots of categories here, folks, lots of interesting results. You have your favorite vendors um, for certain things. Go check out, see how they ranked in this year's Reader's Choice Awards. And don't forget, if you and if you're not happy with it, if you were like, "What is going on?" There's no way that Cynix has the best Internet of Things offering. That's tech data all the way. I'm, I, I don't know if you'd be that animated about that, but if you are, hey, there's always next year's 2020 or 2022 right. Reader's Choice Awards. Go make sure next year you vote. And you can set the record straight. Have your voice. Or, or send your complaints to Rich. Or, <laughs> yes, yes. You could uh, podcast at channelfornetwork.com. Any complaint you have, I will make sure that gets right over Mr. Rich Freeman. <laughs> uh, right away. No, no. And say, hey, send us your thoughts on this, uh, on the list. That, that email address that I gave you is real. Uh, we, always, we always love to get emails. And, um, yeah, send, them, send, them, send, us, send it our way. Podcast at channelfornetwork.com. Uh, all right, Rich, I think it's probably a good place to move on. And talk about uh, something that I know lots of people dread, and people are either either really good at it or they're just they just fear it uh, more than anything else. And that is cold calling. Rich, tell us what this is about. Yeah, well, that you know um, the, the reason we dedicated some space to this topic in the most recent issue of the magazine is exactly uh, what you're talking about there. I mean, I think um, a, a lot of people listening right now recognize that. Cold, cold calling um, uh, can be, probably should be an important part of um, your, your marketing routine, but it, it's also, um, I mean, maybe especially for channel pros who tend to be a little more on the introverted, shy kind, it, it is not an easy thing to do, to, to talk uh, to strangers on the telephone. And so we have a, a brief um, article in the, the latest issue of the magazine with just a few quick tips um, about maybe things you can do to, to make that just a little bit easier for yourself. Um, you know, one of those tips basically was um, to not rely too exclusively on code calling. If, if you're using other marketing techniques, including some of the stuff we're going to talk about later in the show, that can kind of um, ready the way for you so that um, uh, somebody on the receiving end of your call knows your name, knows your company, is maybe a little bit more likely to actually take the call so that you're not wasting your time placing phone calls that nobody ever answers. Um, scripts can be very helpful, uh, especially if you are at all uncomfortable or, or awkward uh, on the phone. So um, prepare a few of them um, for different audiences, the decision maker, the, the gatekeeper who's going to get you to the decision maker, um, et cetera. So think about the, the two or three kinds of people you're likeliest to end up talking to and think through what you want to say to them so that you, you're effective and crisp and, and compelling in your delivery. Um, and then remember, and I know this is something Ed believes in big time, just remember, especially if you're speaking to the decision maker, this is probably a business person, not a technical person. So you need to be talking about business, not technology. Don't talk about the stuff that you know best and are most passionate about. Make sure you're talking about what's really going to matter to them. Um, but, um, but with that, I kind of want to turn things over to Ed, because I mentioned before, Ed, that, you know, I, I have long thought of you as somebody like a go-to source of insight on recruiting, because we've had interesting conversations about that before, but you're also someone who I think of as being, um, especially, uh, disciplined about, um, you know, dedicated towards marketing and making the time and, and actually building that into what you do. Um, so I was curious to know what you think about cold calling and its its effectiveness and how to do it better. I think cold calling is essential. I think it's harder than ever. Um, and at my company, unfortunately, it falls on me. And so it doesn't always get done. Uh, it will for a period, 
you know, I'll schedule it on the calendar and everybody knows and I'll tell them I'm doing it so they can help hold me accountable. But my ego is only so strong and you're getting hung up on and you're getting rude people. It's brutal. I More power to people who can do this all the time because they must have skin as thick as iron or something. But um, it's tough. But you still got to be able to do it. I, I will tell you one of the reasons I'm so good at marketing is because I try to find any other way of attracting a prospect than having to call them because <laughs> yeah. I'm least comfortable with that. It's got to be harder and harder too, particularly as, um, you know, like millennial generations, you know, the younger whippersnappers uh, uh, that have never really grown up with voice calling being a big thing. I remember like when I was young, it was like, you know, you wanted to talk to a friend, you picked up the phone and you called them and like you talked via voice and the kids today, they don't do that. I mean, some, some do video calling. Uh, I noticed that like at least the, the, my, a lot of the young, younger generations that I see, they're very, uh, they're very good with video calling, but otherwise it's, it's text only. And it's very, very little, like pick up the phone and call. Yeah, and, and executives and decision makers increasingly are just not answering their phone. Uh, they're looking at the, uh, the speech-to-text transcripts and deciding who they want to talk to, or those calls are going through some kind of reception person. Um, so it's, it's brutal out there. Any other tips that you could give us that uh, you found that been successful? Uh, well, Rich actually said it. So it's think about what's going to intrigue your audience. Um, and you've literally only got, in my mind, seven to 10 seconds to intrigue them on a message. Assume that when you're doing the cold call, you're probably not going to get anybody, but you'd better have a good hook. How are you going to offer them something that's going to improve their life or their business um, and intrigue them right then? And if you don't, it's over. There, I, I'm very quick with that when I get the vendor calls. Okay, that's nothing flesh, you know, and they're they're gone. So how about, so, how about something like this is a hook? If you ever want to see your dog again, you better stay on the phone. I don't know who you are, <laughs> or, but I have a set of skills. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's awesome stuff. I, I it'll be interesting to see as time goes on how how um how important cold calling is in 20 years, you know, when you get, get a new generation of people and executives that don't, maybe don't use the phone as much, maybe social is much more widespread as a, as a communication mechanism. Um, when we look at things that are high likelihood of success, um, if you're doing marketing via the internet, so you're casting a very big net. I always think cold calling is a lot like being a sniper. If you make a connection right then, you've hooked a live one and you're gonna have a meeting, that's great. But there's a lot of things that have to happen for you to be successful in doing that kind of work. And if we think about the sniper, they go through a lot of training versus I can just throw a net out in the ocean and, and reel in my catch, uh, you're gonna get a lot of bycatch, maybe good, not good fits. So there's, there's reasons for the cold calling, but there's also a, a major job to do if you want it to succeed. Is there such thing as like cold visiting? Like, do you have staff that just goes that. to businesses? Well, what, what I like to do is if we're in a new building and we just signed an agreement is go introduce myself to everybody in that building. You know, it doesn't take many minutes. Most people are not going to care about you, but occasionally you get those individuals, really? Well, we're looking for a new company and they signed with you? Great. Uh, let me make an appointment with Bob so you can talk to him. It's, it's worth your while. Come on. <laughs> I, I was at a conference, this was probably 2019, it's got to be pre-pandemic, but I was at a conference where um, salespeople from some pretty large uh, uh, IT companies from Southern California were, you know, sharing tips. And one of them said that, you know, she'll just go to a building, an office park somewhere and knock on. And I remember thinking to myself, really, does that actually work? But uh, it does. Uh, well, uh, but you can get thrown out of a lot of buildings if you don't have a client in the building. Hmm. Yeah, and that's happened to me a couple of times. But as long as you've got a client in the building and somebody reports you and the office building manager comes over and talks to you, oh, yeah, well, I'm with so-and-so. And I'm just, I was being friendly. Sorry, I won't do it again. <laughs> <laughs> that was the last time you had to get bailed out of jail. I think I remember that. <clears throat> yeah, we won't talk about that, though. 
Uh, very interesting stuff. It's a great article. L really good tips. I encourage everyone to go check it out uh, on the channel for I had one complain about it. it was too short because this is yeah. a huge topic. Yeah. Yeah. Fair point. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, the magazine space is sometimes limited and they got to be concise. But What's up who with knows? That? I, I'm sure I, I'm sure there'll be there'll be more on this topic in the future because it got, I think it got a lot of um, a lot of hits too, Rich. So it, it's a perpetual topic. Every time I go to one of my peer groups, everybody's, you know, either we're talking about marketing or cold calling or hiring or <laughs> there's probably a top 10 that we all just ding, ding, ding for forever. Yeah, maybe, Rich, maybe we should do like a like a cold calling clinic or something like that, like a webinar. Wouldn't that be interesting? Yeah, you know what? That, it, could, it could be a great uh, event session somewhere down the road. Some, yeah, yeah, especially oh, if some that really idea. experts uh, yeah. showing how they would make the call. I, I'd tune in for that. This is all good ideas, Rich. Make sure you jot that one down and we'll do that. But we are going to take a break. And why are we going to take a break? It's important because we have got an awesome interview that we did with Matt Solomon of Channel Halo and um, Kevin Lancaster of Venture Monitor. You should probably know them from their times at ID Agent and Kaseya, so that's why, why you know the names. Uh, they, they're going to sit down with uh, Rich and uh, Ed and myself, and we're going to have a, just a, uh, it's a great conversation. It talks about um, scaling MSP growth. We're going to touch on things like like uh, like social media use and uh, things like that. And it, it's just, it's a it's a, a really, really great conversation. Everyone's gonna love it. Uh, stick around for that. We'll be back in just a second. Ready to grow your business in ways you haven't even imagined yet? Tune in to B2B Tech Talk, Ingram Micro's global podcast, to hear what's next in the IT space. Industry leaders, subject matter experts, and more share their valuable insights to provide listeners with the best growth opportunities, with some interesting stories sprinkled in along the way. Listen, subscribe, and follow B2B Tech Talk wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts, because it's time to imagine more. Hello and welcome back to part two of Channel Pro Weekly. You know, modern day SMBs are faced with trying to understand the growing complexity of IT paired with a huge need to secure themselves from the increasing number of threats in the world. A lot of them need help. It's never been a better time to be a Channel Pro. But MSPs face their own challenges growing and scaling their businesses to meet increasing demands from their customers. Now, here to talk about some strategies for MSP growth is Matt Solomon of Channel Halo and Kevin Lancaster of Venture Mentor. Welcome, guys. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Yeah, excited to be here. Uh, long time listener, first time participant. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Well, we're really glad to have you here. Um, if you can, take a, take a couple minutes to, uh, Matt, we'll start with you. Tell us a little bit about you and what you do at Channel Halo. Sure. Um, well, I probably most people in the channel know me from my, my days with ID Agent, with Kevin, of course. Um, so, you know, over the last couple of years, I've been on the road talking uh, to MSPs at, a, at events really all, all across the world um, about dark web monitoring and security and, and really sales strategies. Um, and so uh, after the acquisition, uh, stayed at Kaseya for about two and a half years and, and decided it was time for me to, to move on and, and try to do my own thing. Um, and I launched uh, Channel Halo back in um, June or July, I guess, uh, of this year. So not 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 very long ago, um, where I'm doing consulting uh, with both the vendor side and the MSP side on go-to-market strategies, uh, uh, social selling, uh, and presentation skills. Because I noticed a real uh, gap in, in kind of the storytelling. Um, when you know, actually, one of the when we were out of Dallas Channel Pro, I started watching some of the vendors because I don't always have time normally, and I was like, man, there's there's a real need um, for you know an improvement in messaging on both sides. So that's uh, that's what I've been doing uh, recently, and then having a great time. It's it's pretty fun to be a vendor agnostic for the first time. I imagine it's pretty scary, kind of leaving something very secure like a like a part of Kaseya, and then kind of going out on your own. What is that? What has that been like for you? Um, I mean, it was definitely a leap of faith. I mean, luckily, you know, I have Kevin as a mentor and I've been able to uh, ask him lots of questions, some some of them very basic. Um, but I, you know, I was able over the last couple of years to build a pretty good reputation, um, got to know a lot of people, um, had that luxury of being out, you know, in front of in front of MSPs and vendors. And so the, the response I got has been overwhelming, even from people who you would consider 
competition, I guess, in the consulting world. Everybody's so willing to share and that it just reminds me of how amazing this community is. MSPs share stuff in peer groups and it's just kind of the same thing on the vendor side uh, from what I'm seeing. Um, and yeah, I've had new opportunities to do really fun things like I'm a brand ambassador for Build It, um, the event coming up in a couple of weeks, from IT by Design. And so I'm just doing doing new things and it's been a lot of fun. Awesome. So, uh, did you, are you working like out of your home? Did you get an office? Well, how, how officially established are you? Uh, yeah, I'm out of my home. I've got it. I, now my setup at home is was better than my setup was originally in our old offices. So yeah, I've got, a, I, I think I've got a great little office at home that I'm enjoying. And, you know, I also try to get on the road and be part of the event still. So Cool. Does it have its own like espresso maker? Because that's how you know you have a really good home office. Uh, technically, our apartment complex does. So if I go down to the lobby, I can <laughs> I can make an espresso. So. That's the best. That's the best. Well, awesome. Well, thanks for being here. I got uh, really excited to pick your brain about a lot of the things we're going to talk about. Uh, Kevin, I'd like to take, give you, uh, you also an opportunity to tell us a little bit about you and uh, and what you do at Venture Mentor. Sure. Uh, first, I'll say that I think Matt did a hell of a job over to well, actually over five or six years of being an evangelist for, you know, not only just ID agent, but helping MSPs grow and, and just tackle a lot of these challenges that you mentioned at the, at the, uh, at the, at the jump of the, uh, of the interview. But um, yeah, so he's done a heck of a job. Um, so I, uh, I have a, my background is, is being a serial entrepreneur. So I've, I've founded uh, consulting companies, professional services companies, tech companies, scaled them and most recently exited out of ID agent, sold that to Kaseya. Uh, and similar to Matt, I, I was on for just over two years at a, essentially a two year commitment to help uh, transition and help with go to market strategies and stay on a little bit longer to help uh, CJ, the president with go to market and uh, integrating different solutions. I had the, the fortune or the, uh, I was given the, the ability to acquire a couple companies while I was at Kaseya, so I led a lot of the corporate development. So acquired companies like Rocket Cyber uh, and uh, Graphis on the anti-phishing side of the house. So a really unique exposure to the more, uh, some of the more interesting elements of you know, this broader you know, industry that we call the channel. So, so walking, uh, you know, you know, taking a step off the ledge, I guess, back in April, Similar to Matt, I had a number of uh, organizations that reached out and said, "Hey, we'd like to replicate what you did at ID Agent. You know, help us figure out the growth model. How do you create the, how do you create the the excitement that you guys created? How do you create the velocity you created? And then ultimately, you know, some are asking, well, how do we how do we get acquired? How do we go out and raise venture capital? So, I spent the last, I guess, almost four or five months working with a number of of tech. Uh, organizations. Some are mature, some are in the startup uh, mode, and uh, but uh, I've been able to be pretty selective in, in working with some ones that are just really kick butt next gen technologies. So I'm, I'm out here having a blast. Well, that's uh, that's fascinating and, and very exciting. I've I've really noticed that when talking to a lot of entrepreneurs that it's like it's almost like a genetic part of, of like who you are, like you start a business and then you sell a business and you just have to start another one. Like there's never seems to be an end. Is, is that how you would ex describe your experience? It's absolutely twisted. Yeah. We're, we're sick individuals. Now, um, <laughs> yeah, look, I, with the consulting firm that, that I've owned for the last almost 20 years now, right. That's been around for forever. Uh, spent time, working with, I guess, roughly 3,000 companies and helping them in different various stages of their growth, of their maturity model. A lot of them are focused on the public sector. So maybe they had a, a, a solid uh, commercial practice, but they wanted to grow and, and sell in the public sector. And so we did a lot, of, a lot of incubating and development of companies. And so aside from starting my own, I had the experience or the ability to work with these companies for when I was really actively involved for about 15 years. And you just, you get the bug and, and, um, and, Fred and and CJ and everyone at Kaseya, they were you know beyond gracious in acquiring you know ID Agent and and uh, allowing us to do you know to to flourish I guess under the ID Agent brand or the Kaseya brand. But to your point, yeah, you, you uh, it's kind of just it's part of your DNA. Like you can't stop you know thinking about what can you create next, what value can you can you create, and how can you help people. And that's where. Uh, that's where I'm stuck, I guess. 
So what's the addictive part for you? Because I've, I've, I've talked to some entrepreneurs where like the part they're addicted to that they always have to try to get back to is like when they when they hit some kind of size, you know, like I've scaled it to this. Some it's like they just love the 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 tough part of the very beginning when you're scrapping as much as you can to, to grow in, in initially. What part is it for you that really draws you back? It's probably all of the above, but I think the two that stand out, I think it was, I was, uh, I was mentoring or coaching Matt on this. Like there's some days where you're locked in your, your home office and it's like, you know, it, it just, you're, it, it's tough, right? It's like, you're slugging through. How am I going to figure this thing out? What am I going to do? You have a lot of self doubt. What am I, what is my value? People are really going to, you know, buy what I'm selling, right? Do they, you know, the, my experiences really translate into being able to help people. And that's, I think in looking back in any, any business or any platform, especially with ID agent, right. Um, you look back and you're like, man, that those early days were, you know, they, some of them sucked, don't get me wrong, but you know, they, they help you grow. And so I, I think that's one element of it. And then I think the other is just, it's the, the ability to have impact, right. Um, you know, some of the, I see that actually, which is interesting in some of the, the groups I've been working with, and you, you talk to the founders and whether, they, whether they're technical or their business founder. And I think the more most common trait that I'm seeing is that they want to have an impact. They want to help solve problems. And I think if you go into these things, you know, with that type of mentality, that's when, you know, you know, everything else falls into place. If you, if you pick the right problems to solve, then, you know, the rest should come, you know, relatively relatively with these, but uh, it's not always the case. But uh, I, I think it's it's looking back and, and being able to appreciate the tough times, but then, you know, looking forward and seeing what else can you, what problems can you solve? With ID agent, you know, it was, it was very clear, like security, cybersecurity is just a, it's a boil the ocean concept. And it's, it's just, you know, it, it, it's mysterious. And, and most of the MSPs are still trying to figure it out. And we brought along something that just made it so stupid simple. Like this is your password and you need to do something about it. And when people saw it, at, you know, and they had that like moment of like, oh crap, we knew we we're onto something. We knew that we we're going to actually have a pretty big impact. So, well, and, and I was going to add, you know, there's, there's two parts about that. It, it so much is about the journey though. I think, um, you know, just going through what I'm, you know, with channel halo and starting to your point, you have that doubt you know, some days you're just like, you're so confident. And then other days you have that doubt. And I'm a big believer in, in being authentic and sharing kind of that journey with people. And I actually thought about like in a notepad, just marking every time I have a doubt about it, because it really does add up. You, you be surprised how many times over a course of a couple of weeks or whatever you have doubt about it, uh, but you keep pushing forward. And I think most people who are listening to think ID agent was this overnight success, but and it was in the MSP space, but it but there was a lot of a of journey that happened before that that was not fun. Um, and I've told Kevin this story many times. That, you know, there was about eight months when we were selling into the Fortune 500 companies, uh, and they they just didn't get it. It was before LinkedIn, Dropbox, and MySpace had been breached. So for some reason, they just didn't appreciate that credentials could be a huge risk that were on the dark web and. Honestly, like for eight months, it was it was hard for me to get out of bed to go to work because it just wasn't resonating for whatever reason. But then we, you know, then things changed, and I went from, you know, hardly being able to get out of bed to sprinting to work for two straight years. You know, and so it was, that's what you look back on and remember. So that, if it had all come easy, I don't know if it if it would felt as good. Yeah, there there was that moment where so ID agent was was uh, started in DC downtown DC. I live out in the, the Annapolis area, Maryland side of DC. Matt lived what, 10 blocks from the office or something like that. And yeah. when it started to take off, maybe more, but started to take off, you know, you couldn't wait to get into the office. Cause literally we're, we're 14, 16 hour days, but I get up early, but I had to get up another extra hour early, like 4 a.m. to get in to try to beat Matt into the office. <laughs> Cause he had like a five minute walk and I had an hour, you know, DC you know, commute even at like, you know, six o'clock in the morning. So that's, so you look at back at some of those things where it's like, man, I, I remember many of those drives in just thinking, yeah, I can't wait to get into the elevator to get pop and then like open up the laptop and like, you know, start getting stuff done, you know? So yeah, there's, there's some moments that you really appreciate, you know, when you look back at, at the excitement and, and the early days of, of building some of these startups. 
Yeah, overcoming challenge is definitely a part of it. Man, I, I was gonna joke when you said it wasn't an overnight success. I thought you were gonna say it was it took two nights to be to be successful. Yeah. So so Kevin, I, I gotta ask one question just because these are the kinds of questions that I, I I just can't help myself asking. For those who are watching, like you've got some pretty good sized arms, man. Like you got some guns on you. <laughs> oh like, do you are you like a like a, a gym frequenter or do you like participate in some kind of extreme sports? Not well, no, how do I answer that? No, I, I, I firmly believe that you know, fitness is, uh, is one of the, the keys to success. So, um, I'm not much at, uh, of working out and lifting heavy weights these days. Maybe when I was younger, um, I think I, I lifted and, and did all that stuff a little bit too much. And so now I spend my days trying to run off uh, the calories and, and do all the cardio things, but um, yeah, it, 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 fitness for me is, is something that it's just, yeah, I, I have to start the day that way. That has to be part of my day in order to be, to get anything done. And so, um, yeah, I appreciate the, the flattery there, but, uh, no, it's, uh, well, whatever you're doing, keep, keep, <laughs> it's working for you. Like I, I, I rich got has, has his own like fitness routine. I would like to see you guys arm wrestle, rich. Like let's, let's see a show. Oh, yeah. Off. <laughs> yeah that's a good idea let's put some money down on that <laughs> yeah matt, matt the secret is he had me working like a dog while he got to work out in the mornings that was pretty much what it was <laughs> hey, you know lessons learned <laughs> Hey, you know, but before we forget, um, part of why we have both of you here right now, aside from the fact that you you are both um, sort of in new roles, newly um, independent, you are also co-hosting a brand new podcast. Um, so tell folks a little bit about what what that is and and what it's about. Well, the, the good news is that uh, this is probably one of the hardest branding exercises I've ever had to go through. My goodness, it took us probably about a month to come up with a, a darn name for this thing. Um, and we actually landed on it uh, Monday, Tuesday, something yeah. like that. So, so decided to call the, uh, the podcast uh, uh, channel five, you know, we thought, yeah, uh, do we want to have something broader, bigger, you know, do we want to be top 10 on Spotify and all these other platforms? Um, so let's come up with this global, you know, sales and marketing, destroy everything type of title or, you know, do we niche down and really title it something that, that, you know, relates to the content. Uh, and so we've, I think have pretty unique experiences in this space, right? And having been on both sides, you know, building a services company, selling and, and implementing technologies that, you know, hundreds, you know, I wouldn't say thousands, but hundreds of, uh, of government agencies running, you know, large, uh, technology deployments and a pretty interesting perspective and you know, maybe appreciation of the MSP side for what it takes to build an MSP and, and those types of businesses. And then I've had uh, the fortune to be able to build technology companies and then work at one of the, the tech titans in the industry to say it. And uh, so thought we had a, a pretty interesting perspective. And then Matt's background, you know, if you've, you know, if anybody has followed Matt for the last four or five years, it's been amazing to watch him just, you know, flourish out there in, in the world of social and social selling. And so I think Matt has built a, a pretty unique uh, skill set experience in, in social and, and that translates very well into what, you know, how people sell today, you know, how MSP sell, how vendors sell. And so, so we thought, you know, bringing these two capabilities or, or, you know, skill sets, experiences, life skills, whatever together in a podcast, we thought it, thought it would be interesting might not be people might say this is a, the worst thing that i've ever heard but uh you know we'll we'll keep pretending that it, it's uh it's cool yeah, well, and i'll just add it you know i think one of the things that we wanted to hone in on is is also you know there's the, there's the obvious people in the channel that that you're going to bring on but we also want to bring insight from outside of the channel it, it's something i did at id agent where we would bring in sales and marketing experts from other industries um because you know sales and marketing is applicable across industry it's not one you know it, it it can follow similar patterns yeah there's there's some in, in, you know ways to do it differently in our space but yeah i think it's important that we we bring in some of the, the leaders that are doing things maybe at a faster pace you know um and so you know i think 
allowing MSPs to see that I think can also help them separate themselves from, from other MSPs and sa same things with vendors. And so right now we have it more in it's, uh, so we, we do live sessions and we're putting them on YouTube. We're stacking them for the podcast because for the, for, for the algorithm of like Apple, you have to have a series of podcasts when you first launch for them to even care about it. Um, so we're kind of stacking this. So we'll, officially launched the podcast uh, probably in a couple of weeks, but you can go on YouTube and see us through there as well right now. And we'll make sure to uh, to link to that uh, that YouTube page there so folks can uh, can check out those early episodes. You, you know, Matt, one of the things Kevin just highlighted there in, in terms of your areas of expertise is um, social media, social media marketing. I mean, in, in your experience, how how widely do channel pros out there use social media in marketing and how well on average do they do that? Um, well, yeah, I'm certainly starting to see it more, uh, you know, obviously with COVID, you know, people started getting more comfortable, I think, in front of the, the camera. But overall, and I'm not just talking about in the channel, overall, there is not a lot of people that are taking full advantage of social media. Um, I think there was a statistic that 1% of the, I don't know how many, there's like 300 million users, or it might even be much higher than that, of, of LinkedIn, it's only 1% are consistently putting out content. And if I'm, if I'm an MSP owner, and I'm thinking 1%, that means like nobody in our space is probably putting out content, I could really stand out just by putting it out there. Um, and you almost force your way um, into an algorithm of being in front of, of a network. And the unique thing about LinkedIn versus like Facebook if you go out and post something on Facebook, it, it's really tied to your network. In LinkedIn, you could it could blow up and it could go virtual, and everybody you know can see it essentially. Um, so, Rich, if you like my piece of content, your network's going to see it, and you know if Kevin then likes it too and makes a comment, it can just explode. I mean, I, I've had you know fortunate times where I've had some of the posts that I've done have gone 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 views. Um, so you have that bigger opportunity and. What we often find is that, let's say you have a video that gets a couple hundred views, but you're not getting maybe a lot of people liking or commenting. Uh, for an MSP, you might not realize that somebody's watching your content for a while. And you know, it's all part of that buyer's journey. Yeah, they're, maybe they're not ready for a change in MSP today, but they've been ingesting your data or your content for the last six months through LinkedIn. And all of a sudden you get a message six months from now and saying, hey, I've been watching you. And I think it's great what you're doing. We, we're not happy with our current MSP. I'd love to set up a call. And I hear example after example of that happening. Uh, it just, they never technically engaged. So they, the audience is out there. You just might not always know it. And it's, it's so it does take a commitment, uh, but the ones that do it, um, you really, they really do stand out. Um, you know, and I, I wanted to add. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to add that too often, A, you're correct, the vast majority of uh, MSPs are not posting, but when they do, it tends to be always about speeds and feeds and technology, and your audience doesn't want to hear that all the time. Talk about things that they they care about, their passions. Um, a few months ago, uh, one of my employees had a new baby, and we did some posts about that. They got more likes and views and shares than anything we did. And so we shouldn't be so tied up on technology. Let's talk about what people are also interested in. Um, and, and often you get more visibility. You know what, cat pictures work really well too. Those get lots of likes. Absolutely. If, if, I, could, if I could jump in on that, you know, what was interesting is uh, with ID Agent, uh, we would do some co-marketing uh, programs, campaigns, webinars, what have you with, uh, with Huntress right, with uh, Kyle over at Huntress. And we never talked about our products, right? We never talked about our technology, right? Kyle has one of these kind of, you know, larger than life type personalities. And, and because he's tactical and he comes from, you know, the, the agency world, you know, people really, really latched onto that. And so a lot of what Kyle would do, you'd see out on, on LinkedIn and in Facebook, other areas, he just bring his personality out. It wasn't really about Huntress. You know, it was a byproduct, and you know, ultimately, you know, he was able to demonstrate the technical chops, and and people really, you know, gravitated toward it. But um, yeah, I think that's one of the things that are that's really missing in this space right now, and it's one of the reasons, honestly, why I think we did really well, 
you know, we had first mover advantage in, in the marketplace and, and we got tremendous scale early on. Um, but there was a point maybe a year into our, our working into the MSP space where, you know, Matt was going out there and, and putting videos up there and, and I was trying to, trying to keep up, but, um, a lot of it just became, man, I see you everywhere. It was more of a, you know, more of that we built a, a personality and a connection with the audience versus, you know, just, just posting. And, and it was at a, a show, I won't name the show, uh, but, uh, you know, a couple of months ago, and as Matt mentioned, it's really nice to be agnostic at, you know, for, for a while, like not having to wear, um, you know, a particular vendor shirt, uh, and you go down the line and it's like, everybody says the same thing, you know, in the security space, everybody's got the hacker with the hoodie and, you know, the bits and the bites and, you know, everyone's quoting the same statistics and I'm like, where the hell's the personality? Like, you know, the, the ones that are going to win in this space, the vendors that are going to win, the MSPs that are going to win, you know, in, in their, in their locales are the ones that can put a personality and connect. And to your point, post post things about their employees and, and having, you know, children putting the cat pictures up there and being a little bit more authentic versus, you know, just the scripted content. And it's, that's a very hard thing to do. It's hard just to get content out, but then it's extremely hard to be, you know, more, more personable, you know, cause it's, there, there's a, it, that's, that's a hard thing for a lot of the, the tech introverts in this industry. Yeah, and I was gonna just add two real quick, cause I think Ed, you brought up such an excellent point, which is, you know, bring people into your world, um, be authentic. Uh, you behind the scenes stuff, you'd be shocked at how, how well that goes over. You know, it's funny, they're not gonna be able to see this because they're listening. Like, I'm gonna take a photo of the setup that we have right now, and we're on a podcast. Bring people into what's happening in your world, and it's just astonishing how much value that that provides people because then they see, oh, that I can do that too. Um, I had a, I put out blooper videos um, because I think people think that you know, because I speak a lot that I don't mess up on videos, but that's not the case. That's not the truth. And I put out some blooper videos and the blooper videos got way more traction than the actual original video that I put out. Um, and, and what's really interesting is the engagement I got on those videos, 50% of those uh, uh, engaging were first time engagements on my content. And so tinkering with just different things. And the other thing I'll give a shout out to Ed, because Ed, I used to have a, a, a slide deck with you and you in it as an example of doing something a little different, which was, this was an, when I think we had in person, but you you brought in an actual attacker uh, to one of your events. I can't remember if it was in person or webinar, but you know, it's like, okay, your, your, your networks might love hearing you talk Ed, but they also like hearing from another person, you know? So I thought that was a really creative idea. I mean, I, I'm, I'm guessing it went really well for you. Yeah, it's funny. People do business that they know, like, and trust. If all we ever do is throw out, you know, this widget or that that solution, that's easy for a for a person online to just go look up elsewhere. But if you're genuine, that's unique, and and that's a reason to engage. Yeah, absolutely. So, so Matt, for the probably 99% of the people listening right now who have not really gotten started in, in social media marketing, what, what's the first step? You know, how do you put your toe in the water, essentially? Um, well, you first make sure you have a profile. Um, and it's, it's certainly if you're an owner of an MSP, and I'm astonished to find out how many don't actually have a company page. And I think it's an important distinction. You have to have a company page. But what is going to be your main source of content is your personal page. People are not out on LinkedIn to do business with your company per se. They'll look up information about your company. And trust me, if you don't have a logo or some about me there, it will count negatively towards you. I mean, you know, there's another stat like 75% of buyers are doing the research, you know, through LinkedIn ahead of time, ahead of having that conversation. So you got to make it sure that you look like a legitimate company. But really, the mo most of the content they're going to engage on is you as the individual. And so, number one, make sure your profile is up to date. But really, I think the first step is, and I think because I think video is such an important piece of this content, just start doing it. Um, I had the opportunity to speak in front of a couple of sales leaders last week, or, or earlier this week, excuse me. And actually, I saw one of them posted his first video today. Just, just put it out there. It doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, but you should start becoming a voice for your network. Cause I, I always, I kind of have this line. It's like, you can't allow 
everybody else to be the the voice of your network. I mean, that's what that's what ultimately is going to happen. They're going to find somebody who's speaking ar- around these topics and things like that, and you don't want them to gravitate towards them. You, you need to put it out there. So, I think step one is just put put a, put together your profile, make sure it's there, your company profile as well as your own, and start just putting out your experience on video. FAQs probably like everybody struggles with content. Think about what are the frequently asked questions that uh, a, a small business might have about an MSP. That's very easy kind of low hanging fruit that you could put together. Um, so that's another tip. And then look at other influencers, you know, both on the channel, the vendor side or MSPs that are doing it really well. Um, you, you don't you don't have to reinvent the wheel on any of this stuff, but you want to create your own versions of this. And I think there's lots of resources out there. To, I mean, you can follow me, of course. Um, you know, Andrew Moon's another great example. He's, he focuses on, you know, LinkedIn for MSPs as well. So there's lots of people out there that are doing really cool things. Bob Coppage is an MSP out there who puts out video almost every day. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's, there's lots of other resources available to you. I think the hardest part is just doing it. Like the first, just doing the first one, I think is, is the hardest part. You'll do, take so many takes, you know, you'll, you'll criticize every element of it, but it's, it's almost like, building technology, MVP, like just get it done. I did one yesterday morning. I got uh, inspired, I guess, when I was halfway through a run yesterday morning, I'm like dripping wet. We've got the mid-Atlantic humidity. You know, it was like a 13 second, 14 second little video on LinkedIn. It was like, you know, what are you going to do different today? You know, just something that small, you know, and I got uh, people reaching out directly on LinkedIn asking about, you know, different uh, technologies. It was, it was interesting how, you know, something so quick, 13 second, just non-scripted, you know, how much of an impact that can have, you know. And that, but and it's never been easier. easier. I mean, you can you can set up Zoom and tell it to record you. I also use BombBomb and we'll record a little video and stick it in emails. Um, my God, take advantage of the technology that we have. That's that's the one great saving grace we've had with this pandemic is it didn't come 20 or 30 years ago before the technology was here to save us. Um, I think for a lot, Ed, it's it isn't necessarily technology that's stopping them. It's self-confidence. Right. Well, so I, I would say fear. So a moment ago, I was listening to Kevin speak and I was thinking, wow, you know, the vast majority of people out there, they get a job. They they don't have the confidence in themselves to start a business. Of those who start a business, start one business. There's a few individuals like Kevin who are this wacky, they don't see fear or something, and they go out and they do it again and again and again and again. My big regret is that I didn't start my business earlier and allow myself to fail because I would have learned huge lessons. And when I did finally start the business, I wanted it to succeed. And so here I am 21 and a half years into this. And there's Kevin, who's done opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. I'm jealous, but the fear held me back. So I think the fear holds a lot of individuals back from ever making the first step. Those of us who do take the step, we invest in one thing and we stop there. Um, But I always look up to the individuals who do one thing after another. And it's just like, boy, I wish I had a little bit more of that strength in me. Yeah. That's awesome. And, and, you know, one thing I'd add about fear, and this goes back to being authentic, the, I honestly think one of the best first videos you can put out is talking about your fear of putting out your first video. It's very meta, but you would be shocked at how rewarding that experience will be because the amount of fe- people are so supportive when it comes to this stuff. And, and it's a it, it's a professional network you're putting it out to, uh, as, particularly if you're doing it on LinkedIn. And the conversations, I I did it, I I responded to somebody who, you know, we were connected. I don't know him very well at all. I can, I said, man, that's so cool that you put out your first video. He ended up setting up a meeting with me. It was a 15 minute kind of like meet and greet first, first, you know, with Zoom. And he's like, hey, if you're ever looking to expand your business into um, Asia or uh, India, he's like, you know, he's like, I have so many connections over there. And and that all stemmed from him just putting out a video. And he very clearly said, this is my first video. I don't feel comfortable doing this, but I'm, but I am. So, yeah. Did you, did you say it was very meta? Meta. Meta. Yeah. It's meta. 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 Sometimes it helps to look in a mirror and say, I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. And doggone it. 
people like me. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that maybe that's a great um, time to sort of transit because the other thing you mentioned that you um, consult about, uh, Matt, is presentations. Um, and so that's something that almost everybody listening now is doing um, already, but maybe not doing well or as well as they they could. So, I mean, where where do you maybe see opportunities for improvement uh, among channel pros in terms of uh, presentation skills? Um, yeah, so there's a couple of things that I guess stick out to me. One is just natural storytelling. Um, you know, I could go back to ID agent. Fifty percent of our presentation were stories. Uh, just like I said, I. I featured Ed in my presentation, because what better way to show, you know, how a product can actually do something than show MSPs utilizing it in a certain way. And so really painting a story, uh, also bringing in people right away on the top with a story, like not going right in your presentation, giving them kind of an anecdote of maybe, you know, for me, an example would be, uh, yes, my first sales job really was uh, at Bubba Gump Shrimp House in New York City, as, you know, as a waiter. Uh, but I learned some really valuable sales things uh, at that. So you could just find something that's relatable because everybody has worked at a restaurant. For, not everybody, but a lot of people have. Um, the other thing is the PowerPoint presentations. Uh, there's a lot of things about that I would improve. The things that stand out is, I mean, just too much text that's being put on them. You know, it's like stories being told on the slide versus you, the presenter, telling the story. Um, Another thing is having the wrong person presenting. Uh, you know, and I understand not everybody has like a channel chief or, you know, maybe in, uh, I would say on the vendor side, one of the issues is having somebody who's speaking too technical. And that actually could be a problem on both sides, on the MSP side, right? It's about speaking the language of, of, of the end user. And I used to say this all the time when I would speak about the dark web. I, and I am by no means an expert on the dark web. But I did know how to talk to people about how compromised credentials could, you know, be a risk to their organization. And so what I would tell MSPs when they were listening to me present, I was like, present it like this, because your end user doesn't need to know everything about the Tor network, you know, the onion router, like they don't need to know every piece of what makes up the dark web. Um, and in fact, I never did a presentation, I don't believe, where I actually described what the dark web was. People would ask me after my presentations, I just went right into the risk. Uh, so I just never told a story about the actual dark web because I just didn't think it was as relevant uh, and it got technical because then when you start talking about it. Um, so that's another area. I mean, and I know Kevin, I mean, this is something that me and you have talked a lot about uh, yeah, recently. I thought you were going to actually say, you know, they actually put me in, in my place a couple of times early on. I thought right? about it. I thought about it. I, I knew you didn't go there. <laughs> but, yeah. So building a, a government, you know, contracting business, government consulting business, you know, I spent a lot of time with, uh, with the, the agencies and, and studying NIST and all this stuff. So some of the first presentations were all about NIST 800-53 and I'd get all, and he'd look at me like, what the hell are you doing? Right? Like, why, why are you doing this? Stop, stop, you know, and try to kick me under the table. And so, but to his point, right, it's, it's, it's getting, way too deep now with enterprise and and public sector you know, the agencies yeah that that made sense with the audience but uh with the msps yeah sure you know you're talking compliance and you want to throw some of that stuff in there that's great but just in general um you know it was it was it was not the right type of content for the audience and so i think just to kind of summarize what, what matt was saying right it's like you know, it it's all about having you know today visuals not a lot of text on these on these PowerPoints. You think in 142 characters, right? Make it make it you know easily digestible. And it's it is. I think 90% of it is about who's presenting, who's actually delivering the message. Because you know that for a lot of the the partners, it it or the vendors out there, you know it, it makes or, or breaks the presentation. Probably the same thing with the MSPs. And I'd love to see more owners of MSPs take the time and just push themselves and figure out how to present, right? Because that's, you know, that's, you bring the authenticity and, 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 and that stuff, you know, translate into, into business. So. And, and be aware of your time. So yeah. Rich, this is, you know, at some of the large events, vendors sometimes only have a 30 second pitch and I would see them get on stage knowing that their logo is going to be in like just a huge screen behind them. 
but yet they would say their name, their title, their you know name of the company, which I, I saw many get 15 seconds into it and they hadn't even talked about why they're here or whatnot. So, you know, it's, there's a lot of things that I think uh, vendors and MSPs need to be aware of. And, you know, that's, that's part of what, you know, I think one of the bigger reasons I started, you know, doing the consulting, because I, I noticed, I yeah. Say, don't be long winded because you're always telling me I'm getting long winded. Well, that too. Yeah. So, anyway. But it's also having an owner that recognizes that maybe they shouldn't be on stage. They should <laughs> allow somebody else to be on stage. <laughs> sure. <laughs> So for the record, I can take you on being long winded, Kevin. So uh, <laughs> I'm the king of long winded. You know, I, I, um, it, it's a totally different um, topic, but I want to take advantage of the fact that we, we've got somebody here who um, consults with um, vendors about channel partners and channel programs. Um, Cause you're, you're sort of in, in, but you're like a liaison in between the channel partners and the vendors in a sense. And so what, from your perspective, what in your experience is maybe the biggest thing that the vendors tend to misunderstand and get wrong about their partners and what partners want from a vendor? Uh, you know, uh, great question. And so I've spent, yeah, the last several months, that's, that's the one area that I probably spent the most time on working with vendors. To Matt's point, right? You go up to these, you go to an event, and it's, whether it's a pitch or you go down the the trade show, you know, row and, and talk to a vendor, it's like bits and bytes. You know, we do this, we do that. Our button's green, this button's blue, and it's like no, they don't. No one cares, right? No one cares. There's 19 of you, you know, similar companies at this this show, and and each one of you is saying the same damn thing, right? But what they fail to focus on is how's this going to make me more efficient? How's this going to be more, make me more profitable? How's this going to make my you know customers more secure? Is this going to help me with my EBITDA? Am I going to be able to make my technicians more efficient? It's like, what are the outcomes of the product? You know, what, what is this going to help me do better? What's this going to help me, you know, save time on and everybody, everybody focuses on, you know, how great their product is and they don't focus on, you know, the business outcome, you know, really the need you know, that, you know, what's driving the MSP, what, what's the pain point? And a lot of it circles around those things, right? How do I become more efficient? How to become more profitable? How do I cut, you know, costs where, you know, or reduce my, my kit costs? Uh, so I, I think that's probably the number one thing that, that I see vendors, they just, they don't understand, um, they don't understand what drives an MSP and what they're making their decisions based upon, you know, it's, yeah, sure. The tech, the technology, there's got to be, you know, a technical fit there. But at the end of the day, it's what business problems, what, you know, what, what's this going to help me solve? And uh, that, that's completely frustrating because uh, probably the, the thing that's even more frustrating than that is that you'll ask the person that's the BD or the channel chief that question, and they'll talk about the bits and bytes. And then you'll talk to their SDR, their inside salespeople, and they'll talk completely different about the bits and bytes. And then you'll talk to the CTO or the, the CEO and they're way out in, you know, you know, another ballpark where it's with what the value proposition of the, of the technology is and, and all that stuff. So yeah, that, that's, that is hands down the biggest disconnect between the vendors and the MSPs, you know, and, and when the vendors figure that out, when the vendors figure out, you know, how to position and, and really the fact that this is a, this is collaborative, right? This is a, this is a team sport. The vendors don't figure that out. Those are the vendors that end up having, you know, ridiculous, you know, churn because the MSPs are just like, I don't know what to do with this, right? They just, they lose sight of the value proposition. Yeah, and I you was know, just, it, oh, oh, no, no, please, Ed, go ahead. I'd love to oh, well, it. I was just thinking and something that uh, I'm very, I used to be very guilty of, but I was at a conference and somebody talked about this. So starting the engagement, this relationship, it, ask for a date first. Don't try to get married. And recently, I had another vendor calling me and trying to uh, get me to buy things, get me to see demos. And I said, look, can I tell you what I really want? Uh, we already buy a bunch of products from your company. I want to understand what we're buying, what we're paying, and go over this list with me. And I said, and if that goes well, I may be willing to see your demo. I said, but you need permission to play first. Most vendor reps never call back. They never do anything. 
this guy did, by the way, he's from Kaseya, and he blew me away. And, and he did everything I asked. And I said, okay, what do you want to show me? And we scheduled a date for a couple of new products that he thought after having the conversation would benefit our company. He'd gotten permission to, for us to engage. And now I've got other people going to join the call and, and we're going to look at those new products. But uh, too often, MSPs and vendors, they're trying to make the sale. Hi, my name's Ed. Would you like to buy? No. It's like, let's build a relationship. Let's date a while before we try to get married. It's a good point, Ed. And another thing that partners also really want that I think vendors forget a lot is that they want branded socks. They want logoed socks. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But you look, to your point, though, that goes back to the personality, right? You know, uh, I forget which back, I don't know, backup company that that says back back that SaaS up, back your SaaS up or something like that. But that gets back to like, this is an ecosystem. You're building a community, you're building an experience. And, you know, that's, that's the personality, that's the engagement. That's the stuff that builds a ridiculous brand loyalty. And so that's, that's what's missing in a lot of vendors is, you know, it sounds ridiculous, but it's those branded socks, right? It, it's the, it's the t-shirts. I mean, you know, some of the tchotchkes are a little bit over the, over the top, but you know, it's, it's creating an experience. And I think when, when vendors realize again, that this is a team sport, right. That you have to, you have to do those things. You have to train. You have to reinforce. You have to, you know, provide, you know, brandable materials. You have to, you know, provide, you know, all of these social graphics to help them sell. They realize that those are the vendors that do well. Those are the vendors that grow, that uh, they have low churn and and you know healthy bottom lines. And that same thing translates down to. The MSPs, the MSPs that do that, they create the voice, they create the, you know, the the engagement, you know, that kind of feeling of community, like it, it's it's you're you're part of a uh, you know you're part of their business. Those are the ones that inevitably scale and 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 grow and and some get acquired and and you know outcomes like that happen. But this is I have to say it again. I mean, this is an absolute. This is a team sport. So vendors can't win without MSPs and MSPs can't win without vendors supporting them. I'm glad you said that, Kevin, because often I think the MSPs often think, oh, I've got all these vendors and they have to kowtow to me. And I've always felt, I mean, Arlen Sorensen is the one who put this into me. Um, You really need to build a strong relationship with select vendors and they're your go to market and you need to work, do everything you can to support them. Uh, I the other day I was making breakfast for my wife and I ran into a little brush for brushing on sauce that I picked up at Datto's Nashville conference a few years ago. So I took a picture of it on the counter and I put it on there, sharing a little love with Datto and it started a conversation. When you find a vendor that works really well with you, you need to do everything you can to promote them as well. It's a two-way state. It's all, I like what you said, Kevin, it's all about the relationship. Yeah, and I would add you know, to that, I mean, it's a simple thing of, of just listening, but I, I can remember thinking back to like the early days of ID Agent, you know, when we first came out with a model, uh, really before we had a true partner program, I mean, Dave Watts, an MSP out of California, he was like, just so you know, this is never going to fly in the MSP space. And he literally, I mean, he, he basically was instrumental in our, what became our, our model. I mean, yeah. he really was. And we kept listening. And, you know, if you're an emerging vendor, and, and again, it, gets, it goes across vendors and MSPs, but, you know, if you're getting into this space, particularly if you've never been in it, you know, I think having a partner advisory council early on is probably very critical. Like, you know, people are going to be really honest with you of what, of what could work and what not works. So I think having that that feedback early on. And again, I, I don't, there isn't a huge secret sauce to me because it's it's what we just talked about with relationships. You know, Ed, I, I think you could probably rattle off six or seven people from ID Agent uh, because we had a great relationship with you. You had your channel success manager and Leah, you know, you, you worked with me, you worked with Dan, you know, Kevin, like it. You, you, really you guys, were, you guys were thinking way ahead of where most vendors do. I still remember when I approached you guys the first time at a conference at one of your booths and I said, OK, show me your training materials, something that most vendors don't have. You guys had it. Oh, OK, show me your marketing materials so I can go to market easier. You had it. It was like you guys were thinking of what the MSP really needed. 
And uh, that's where you got my loyalty. And, you know, yeah, we're still proud to be using your product. We, we had to, right? You know, it, for as simplistic, you know, as, as, as simple as the concept was, right? Um, like these are your, your passwords, your email address. I mean, we realized that, again, it's just the nature of, of the space. Most MSP owners in particular, you know, they're, they're going out there, taking a step off the ledge and, and going to a lot of these events, trying to learn how to sell and market stuff like that. But at the end of the day, a lot of them are still very much reluctant, introverted. And so we had to spend a ton of time building out training materials, you know, again, for something we thought was like a no brainer, like if this is your password, you need to do something about it. But having that conversation, you know, having the MSP having that conversation with their customers or prospect for a lot of them was, was extremely difficult. And so we had to, we had to nurture them. We had to create the the brandable materials. We had to create the the social graphics. We had to create the event in a box. I mean, the golf tournaments and all that stuff. Because you realize that we are never going to we're never going to scale. Our partners are never going to scale unless we started to really you know put that stuff you know out there. And so when we did that, we just we leaned into it as 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 much as we could. And we had you know, great you know folks like Dan Tomaszewski coming in and, and leading the charge and building out one heck of a team. So yeah, it was, uh, it, there was a lot of just investing in just basic like sales 101, you know, and, and just giving them the framework to be able to go out there. And so again, what we thought was a, a pretty easy, pretty easy concept. But I, uh, I yeah. still use one of the tips that I forget which ID agent employee it was that told me at the booth, Ed, let me show you this portal. When you're going to go in and have a meeting with a prospect, run their information and bring it to the meeting. I can't tell you how many new clients I have because of that little tip. Every time I meet with a new prospect before the meeting, I run their dark web scan and I bring it, show it to them. Huge. Yeah. Yep. It's yep. awesome. There's a lot of uh, stuff for everyone to think about and a, a fascinating discussion and one that could probably go on an, at least another hour if we, uh, if or, we two. Might, but, or two, or <laughs> two, but uh, really great stuff. Um, I want to thank you guys so much. Uh, Matt Solomon from uh, Channel Halo and, uh, uh, and, and Kevin Lancaster from uh, Venture Monitor. Uh, thank you guys so much. Um, also, uh, uh, say the name of the, the podcast again. Uh, it's uh, Channel Fied, F-I-E-D, Channel Fied. Uh, channel five awesome yeah we'll put a link to that in the show notes uh for those who are who are listening and a link to the description on, on youtube uh if you're there to go and check that out best of luck with the new podcast by the way i hope you guys uh, have lots of success and of course give channel four weekly a little bit of love in in some of your of episodes course. as well <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well awesome having you on thank you very very much uh we're gonna take a short break when we come back we're gonna have ed uh with us on the other side to wrap up the show with a little bit of fun and a little bit of uh, a little bit of regular end of the show features. You won't want to miss that. Stick around. We will be back in just a few. And we are back now with part three of Channel Four Weekly. Ed Korea joins us here on the on the final leg of the show. Uh, Ed, thanks for sticking around through the whole show. By the way, it's uh, been great to have you on. Been a lot of fun. And it was a, and that was a really, really good interview with, uh, with, with Matt and, and Kevin, uh, Rich, uh, Ed, uh, Ed, I'll start with you. Any, anything that kind of struck you as very interesting, uh, about that interview, any takeaways? Well, I, I don't think we leveraged Kevin enough. I mean, because he really is, as I said in the interview, he's kind of a unique person, serial entrepreneurs. It's like, what is your secret sauce? And as I mentioned before, a lot of things, fear keeps us from doing these things. He's a smart cookie. And uh, if I could learn a, a bit more from him, that would be time well invested. I, I agree. I, I don't think it'll be the last time we have him on because uh, I think he could speak to a lot of things uh, it, that an MSP was concerned about, especially from the business side. So I, I, I 100% agree. Rich, any, anything that uh, stood out to you? You know, I'll, I'll just I'll pile on um, uh, about Kevin there because I was thinking to myself bef right before we um, started recording the the podcast, and I uh, remember we were going to be talking to Kevin. I was thinking back to the first time I met him, um, which I think was um, I mean I remember exactly where I was. We were at a Channel Pro SMB Forum event. We were in Newark, New Jersey. He was um, sponsoring. I had never heard of ID Agent before because ID Agent had only been selling through MSPs for like six months at that point. Um, and uh, and I think this is like November, 2017. 
Um, and it was, you know, I, you, he mentioned that vendors are reaching out to him because they want to see, can I replicate the velocity you had? The velocity that he had at ID Agent um, going from, you know, zero MSP partners to a thousand plus, I mean, I don't know what it was, 18 months or something like that. It was crazy. So, uh, and, and you know, um, he has hired, um, I, I know some of the people who worked for him at ID Agent, really smart, you know, so he he is very much a very smart very effective manager. Um, and uh, it, it, yeah, it's been um, really interesting watching him at work these last few years. Absolutely. And, and you know, uh, I don't discount Matt Solomon's uh, uh, presence. Uh, he had a lot of really, really interesting things to oh, say yeah. and a lot of good, a lot of good stuff. He's also a very smart guy too. Yeah, great um, personality and, you know, an industry pundit that people, you know, turn to for advice. He's going to do really well in his venture. I think so too. Yeah, I, I agree. And I'm, I'm looking forward to their podcast. I want to go check that out uh, on YouTube as well. I, I think, think that'll be, be one of my regular listens. I Although I learned, I, Rich, like, I also learned from them that people listen to podcasts at like two times speed. Like, that, do you listen to podcasts that way, Rich? You know, I don't. I, I'm not even really sure how to what the setting is to do that, but I, I don't. I, I listen at regular speed. But then again, I don't listen to a lot of podcasts quite as long as Channel Pro Weekly. <laughs> That's I, I, he's not the only one that I've because Matt is a regular listener of the show, and uh, but he's like he's like it's, it's weird hearing your normal voice at, at normal speed because he's like I normally listen at two x the speed, and I, I know some people do that so they can kind of get through shows a little faster and and be able to listen to more podcasts because there's so so many great ones out there. And I'm like I'm like I, I told. I'm like, I've tried to do that, but it's really hard listening to the show when like everybody sounds like they're like one of the chipmunks from Alvin and the chipmunks. So <laughs> I, I listen to them at normal speed, um, just passively, but usually when I'm, I usually always have a show going in my ear, like when I'm driving or outside walking at the gym, whatever, like I'm, I'm normally always listening to something. So maybe I get through a lot of podcasts. I just, I'm just listening all the time it takes me probably takes me longer i'm if i listen to twice the speed maybe i could get in more but I you said, have a speaker in your shower yet uh there is there is one there's one in there yep absolutely yeah, a little bluetooth I, one. i've got my bluetooth one so that's when i listen to my podcast it's usually two while i'm getting ready to take the shower one during the shower one after the shower and uh boom 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 it's it used to be empty time now it's educational time yeah. Oh, and it's amazing how much you can learn from podcasts if you if you just listen to to a bunch of them. So I always just have mine going in, in some show in my ear all the time. Uh, one day, Rich, I think we should maybe do our own list of like podcasts that we listen to. I think that'd be kind of a fun thing to explore and um, highlight some of the shows that uh, that we that we like ourselves. Um, but for that, we're gonna we're gonna end there. Awesome interview. Thanks to them for coming. Rich, I think it's time to play a little bit of five questions with Ed because he's on, he's here, he's uh, he's a very, very interesting guy, and I think we would have a little bit of fun with him. And it's also important to point out too that I, I have like one museum pick left, and then I think I'm out of interesting things that I actually own to talk about. So I'm trying to save that one as long as I can, uh, and then we'll kind of see what the future of a museum pick is gonna gonna be sometime after episode 200, which is rapidly coming. Rich, episode 200 is almost here. Can you believe that? Yeah, right around the corner. Next month, right? Next month, yeah. Crazy, crazy stuff. But Ed, so five questions, if you're not familiar with it, where Rich and I are gonna uh, ask you five questions, kind of rapid fire. Um, the, the the whole shtick of this is, is that uh, Rich and I do not write these questions in advance. We must come up with them on the fly. Uh, so it will be about anything and everything, nothing embarrassing, no getches, nothing like that. But, uh, just some, but I guarantee it will be off topic, uh, just so we can learn a little bit more about you and have a little bit of fun. Are you ready? I'm ready. Not oh, as much as it's going to be. <laughs> as, uh, and there's a there's a quiz after the questions. Rich, question number one to you. Okay. So, you know, th there was this extended period of time when we were all basically locked out of restaurants that, you know, we could get the food brought to us. We couldn't actually go to the restaurant. Thankfully, we can go to restaurants again pretty much everywhere. Um, what what was the first place you went to once restaurants were, were open again? Wow. Um, actually, I never stopped. <laughs> uh -huh. So the, the restaurants here in Silicon Valley, uh, you couldn't go in, but they could serve you at the door or you could pick up something. And, you know, my wife and I work so darn hard. I, we don't like to spend a lot of time in the kitchen. So I'd go pick up things and this and that. But I do remember the first in-person one we did was an Italian restaurant. And, 
I love Italian food and that would, that would, and we love that place. It's great. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Question. If you live here in Silicon Valley, you'd know it if I said it. Because everyone. Uh, well, you can say it. It's, it's yeah. fine. What, what is, what is this, what's the restaurant? Palmadero. And Palmadero. it's a huge, huge restaurant. I mean, it's like covers the area of maybe three or four other restaurants. They have the inside dining, but the outside is three quarters of the place. And uh, the service is amazing. The food is fabulous. Oh, so good. I imagine, see, outdoor dining in California is probably a little easier than it is in northern Illinois when everything was shut down here. It's like you could yeah, go Minnesota, do outdoor uh, dining yeah. <laughs> with a parka on, you know, and yeah. icicles coming down from your face. Uh, yeah, interesting stuff. So question number two to me, I, you talked a little bit earlier about travel. So uh, and you said you'd like to, to visit Mexico. What... What part of Mexico has been your favorite place to travel and see or do? Um, I really like the Riviera Maya over near Can uh, Cancun. And what, what there attracts you? What, what's your favorite well, thing there? Uh, the nice thing is it's kind of a nexus. You've got Isla Mujeres uh, a little bit to the east, uh, which is on, its way, on your way to C uh, Cuba. Uh, south is uh, Cozumel, great diving. Um, you got Cancun proper, you got a lot, and there's so many tourists there that they've actually, they've built up a wonderful restaurant and activity center. There's just so much to do there. Um, so I, I'm big thumbs up on the, uh, Riviera Maya area near Cancun. Excellent. Book your travel today, folks. Yep. Rich, yep. question number three to you. So I, I, I may be barking up the wrong tree here, but you, you mentioned you, you live in Silicon Valley and, and Silicon Valley by reputation has just crazy real estate values. And so I'm just guessing that the, the cost of living in general is maybe a little out of hand in, in Silicon it's Valley. <laughs> so, so what might be a really good example of just how kind of nuts it is? Oh, well, uh, on a personal basis, uh, my house has vastly outperformed the value of my business. <laughs> and that was, that was not Ed's strategic business plan. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, the rule was buy a house so we have a place to live and launch a business. And the business was going to be the big money maker. But uh, real estate, yeah, our house has gone up nearly 4X from what I bought it for. Wow. Yeah. If I could wow. go back in time, I'd buy several. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, go back in time and buy all of San Francisco. And uh, yeah, you'd, you'd probably do quite well. Uh, a couple of my friends are descendants of people who used to own lots of acreage for fields. And what they did is they kept the ownership and they just started leasing out the land and things have been built on them. They will not have to work for generations in those families. Wow, crazy. I, you know, my, my family really should have taught me the value of real estate when I was a little boy. <laughs> <laughs> all right uh question number three is it three question number four to me four. um uh what do i want to go okay so you mentioned cheesecake earlier so let's 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 set the scene here and I'm not, good thing i'm not standing up so you can't see how <laughs> i actually am <laughs> all right so you're approaching the dessert bar and yes. there's there's the pie area there's the cake area and there's the ice cream machine, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where, Ed, do you go? Like, what's the dessert that you're Why going are to? you limiting me? Because <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they said you can only take one. Oh, okay. Well, and you've be... got every dessert known to man on that table. What do you grab? Uh, well, uh, my wife actually brought me home a little half pie the other day of key lime pie to remind me of our trip to uh, um, Key West a few years back. And uh, it was nice of her, but it didn't taste nearly as good as key lime pie in Key West. <laughs> not, not, not even a little bit, obviously. So you're all about the key lime pie, huh? Well, you know, you, you want different experiences that you don't get normally, like a, a thin wedge of, um, oh my God, a pecan pie. You don't want a big one because you'll die of sugar overdose. But, uh, <laughs> but a little little thin piece of really well-made pecan pie, that's good. But I like my ice creams and different things. It's great. <laughs> awesome stuff. And I 100% agree with you. 
Uh, there is no better place to get key lime pie than Key West because it is not the same anywhere else. So that why don't they export it? Why do they keep it all to themselves? I, I don't know, but it is definitely different there. Um, my wife and I were married in Key West and we, we got a chance to go and uh, go and go to a couple of restaurants. And yeah, they, they definitely have the best key lime pie for sure. All right, Rich, question number five to you. Um, very simple one. Um, we're all in one way or another in the tech industry. Um, Ed, what was your first computer? Oh my God. Um, oh God, I usually no, rattle this off the head. This is Stroke Boy here trying to find something in his brain. Um, I know it was a mainframe. God, I can't it had no, it, it had nine switches and you literally had to form the byte with the first eight and the ninth one was just to get the computer to receive the bite. It was terrible. And every time it would die, you'd have to start over to get it to boot manually. But it was a tremendous um, in MSI mainframe. I remember it now. It was an MSI. And it was a great thing for a young teenager to uh, break his uh, experience with because I'm so tolerant of, of technology problems today within a degree, because uh, where I came from, I mean, you know, we had screens that were like 64 characters across by six, you know, today the world is just so different from where I started. So it's, it's been a nice journey. Very cool. Uh, yeah, computers have definitely come a long way in a very, and it, when you look at it holistically, a very, very short period of time um, from where they started, because they started very archaic. <laughs> so if you, if, now, so a uh, bonus question. So if you go back to younger you playing with that mainframe, and if you were to look yes. forward to what a computer looks like today, would you even believe that that's real or would you believe it's science fiction? I don't think I would believe it, particularly with the headsets and virtual stuff. It's just, it's amazing. And, you know, I, here's a bonus answer. Um, you know, I, I hope to retire in about 10 years. One of the reasons I want to do that is I can't even conceive of what's coming in the next 20, 30 years. The, I, I've done a good job of holding on to this industry with my nails and trying to keep up with the technology, but it's it's getting so fast and making such leapfrogs. I can't even imagine where we'll be in the next 20, 30 years. Very true. Very true. Well, interesting stuff. Ed, thanks for playing along. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Uh, Rich, why don't you uh, grab your, your crystal ball and uh, tell us with some accuracy because you're usually pretty good about telling us what happened that we might have missed you get it right most of the time but then look into the future and tell us what we might see i know you're a little, little spottier on that but if you could predict the future what would you tell us well um let's uh let's start with the, the part where i do better which is uh, the stuff that's already happened and uh, a, a great place to catch up on that is our weekly in case you missed it post written by channel pros james gaskin appears on our website every friday um, he's going to be telling you about the new CEO that they have at Barracuda Networks. And the reason they have a new CEO is because the old one left and is now the new president at Palo Alto. Um, Norton bought Avast um, this week, which was interesting. And um, as we have uh, have discussed, Samsung has some new foldable devices. Um, I don't know whether to call them phones or tablets, quite honestly, but um, James will tell you what uh, what to call them. And uh, he's also got something about pickleball, and I won't even try to explain why uh, he's going to be writing about that, but I think you'll enjoy it. Now, in terms of next week, um, the ASCII group is doing its next event in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, where we will be doing an event uh, in some weeks' time. And the Business Technology Alliance, um, a membership group for folks in the uh, principally in the copier printer world, they are holding their national conference in San Diego next week. Excellent stuff. Well, all things to look forward to. I, I am definitely curious about the pickleball article. I want to know what that's all about. So we'll have to check that out. Uh, ASAP. A big, 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 big thank you to our guest uh, host today, Ed Korea. Thank you so much for being on. I hope you had fun. I always have a great time. <laughs> Good. Um, if, for those who uh, want to get in touch with you, uh, learn more about you, how can they do that? Where can they go? How can they find you? Uh, just Google Sagacent, S-A-G-A-C-E-N-T. It's a unique word. It'll find us. You'll find us. And I assume you're on the socials and all that stuff too? Oh my God, yes. <laughs> awesome. So check them out there uh, and uh, get in touch with them. Ed, thanks again for being on. It was, a, my it was, pleasure. A, it was great having you on. Uh, hopefully, we'll get you back again. 
soon. So uh, another place to go, folks, is the Channel Pro Network website. That's channelpronetwork.com. There you'll find uh, articles, news, white papers, downloads, resources, all kinds of stuff uh, that will help you make your business better, keep you uh, informed on what's going on in the world of technology and, uh, and, and lots, lots more stuff like that. So uh, point your web browser there each and every day, such as your homepage. That's where, that's where all the action is. Uh, of course, also subscribe to the Channel Pro Weekly Podcast. Everywhere podcasts are, are pretty much delivered. So if we're on Apple, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, you name, you name it, get, get us there. If you'd like to watch, which we encourage you to do, uh, go to youtube.com uh, slash channel. Uh, I don't remember what our channel name is, actually. I should look that up. Go to YouTube, search Channel Pro Weekly. You'll find us. Uh, and then subscribe there. Hit the red button and the bell and uh, whatever else Google makes you do now to, to subscribe to stuff. And of course, uh, like the hit the like button and leave us a comment. We like those. Podcasts at Channel Pro podcast at channelpronetwork.com is the email address. Uh, send us an email. We want to we want to hear from you and get your thoughts, your takes on anything. We're on the socials everywhere. Uh, so seek us out there. Yada, 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 so on and so forth. So with that, I want to give a very big thank you. We will be back next week. We do have a show for you next week. Uh, although, Rich, are you, you're not on the show next week, right? Uh, that is correct. I'm on, I'm on vacation next week, but you will be co-hosting with Eric Simpson. Ooh, that will be a fun, oh, fun choice. show, folks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that'll be a fun show. I always, uh, I always love it when Eric Simpson's on. So uh, make sure you tune in for that next week. And until then, see you soon. <laughs>